Welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you could take a little time out of your busy schedule and join us today for our webinar. I'm Fran Schoenwetter, Director of Content Marketing with Informa Health and Nutrition and Natural Products Insider, and I'll serve as your host and moderator today. Our webinar today is called Nano is Nonsense, a review of the CBD industry's first human clinical study of pharmacokinetics in food and supplement products. And it's brought to you along with Natural Products Insider by Caliper Ingredients. A little bit about Caliper. Caliper manufactures and distributes Caliper CBD, a proprietary suite of standardized, clean label, shelf-stable formulations of water-soluble hemp-derived cannabinoids, including CBD. Caliper CBD is produced according to standard commercial food manufacturing processes, and it's designed for scalable manufacturing, blending effectively into multiple product applications, including food and beverage. And joining us today as our presenter, as our primary presenter, is Justin Singer. Justin is the CEO and co-founder of Caliper Foods, and later on, we'll also be joined by Keith Bolfel, who is the Director of Research and Development with Caliper Foods. So before we dig right into the subject matter at hand, I just want to go over a few uh, tidbits about this webinar technology. Some of you are familiar. You've been on webinars with Natural Products Insider, Food Beverage Insider before. Uh, I just want to go over a few little, a few little handles here. Uh, platform does allow you to watch the event the way you want to watch it. You can customize the web console. You can move windows around by dragging the title bar. You can resize your windows by clicking on the lower right corner of any window. You'll also notice a toolbar on the bottom of the console. The buttons allow you to open and close widgets on the screen. And one of those widgets is a Q&A widget. I definitely will encourage you and continue to encourage you to submit your questions throughout the webinar. You're not going to interrupt anything. We'll be taking those questions and posing them to Justin and Keith at the latter part of this webinar. So again, submit throughout the webinar. I'll be watching for your questions. Uh, technical webinar questions, on the other hand, will be answered to you directly uh, by a tech person on our team. Uh, so if you do have a problem at all, just please pose that and that'll be directed, uh, an answer will be directed to you individually. Um, you can download the presentation slides from today by clicking on the folder icon on your screen. One of the documents, uh, oh, never mind that, there's just a, uh, the, the full presentation slides are included uh, in a PDF format. You can download those at any time. It's not going to interrupt our presentation. The entire presentation will be saved for on-demand viewing for 365 uh, from this day, and uh, that'll be available on Natural Products Insider in about 48 hours. So if you want to view again or share with a colleague, you'll be able to go back in there if they're registered and uh, view this on demand. Again, I'm going to uh, encourage you to submit your questions. So stay on and stay tuned so we can respond to those. So now onto our topic and the meat of the matter, technical formulation, know-how, and regulatory knowledge is relevant when designing food and beverage products with CBD. It's as relevant for supplements as it is for food and vice versa. Today's webinar, we're going to review published results from the CBDs from the CBD industry's first human clinical study of pharmacokinetics in food and supplements and address some of the nonsensical nomenclature that often does but should not dominate the product development decision-making process. Caliper Foods has spent the last six years developing standardized water-soluble cannabinoid products and technologies to simplify the development process and provide consistent consumption experiences. Caliper also has a seasoned team of food scientists, manufacturing specialists, and quality systems experts. And I'll just say that Caliper considers itself a food and supplement company that specializes in cannabinoids, not a cannabinoid company that plays in food and supplements. So with that, I leave you in the very, very capable hands of Caliper CEO, Justin Singer. Welcome, Justin. Thanks so much, Fran. Really appreciate it. Um, and welcome, everybody, to the show. So we are talking today about 
Nano is nonsense. The first human clinical study of pharmacokinetics in food and supplement products. We'll be making some strong claims today, and we're going to back them all up with data and showing our work, which is a novel concept in food and supplements and this CBD especially, but we're going to do it anyway. So today's lesson plan. First, we'll talk about who we are. Um, then we'll talk about why we're talking about pharmacokinetics. Um, we'll give an overview of the study, key findings in it. We'll try and contextualize what this all means for you as a brand or manufacturer interested or retailer interested in this space. And then we'll open up the floor for Q&A. I've got Keith Wolfel, our director of R&D here, standing by to help with technical questions beyond my competence. Um, some housekeeping items, please ask questions. As Fran noted, there is a chat feature, and we will see those, and we will queue them up to answer the most common ones at the end. Um, this presentation is being recorded. A recorded version will be available on the Natural Products Insider website and our website at Caliper Ingredients. You'll also get an email where everything is posted. Um, and we welcome the opportunity to speak with you directly. This is me at Caliper talking. Just email ingredients at caliper.life, and we can tailor a presentation to your specific needs. So a little bit about me. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Caliper Foods, the parent company to Caliper Ingredients. Uh, I spent four years teaching innovation theory and high-growth entrepreneurship at the School of Engineering at Columbia University. And before that, I was a seed stage investor with IA Ventures, a venture capital firm in New York City. I also have an MBA and a JD, but I am not talking to you as a lawyer. For the love of God, please consult your own counsel. Um, Keith uh, was our first employee over here. He joined after 20 years at m and Mars. Um, while there, he worked on the development, launch, and scale of over 50 new products. He also played a role in the health and wellness incubators of so the Health and Nutrition Venture Group, where he worked on cocoa flavanols. Um, Keith has been a fun – give me a look – flavanoids. Flavanols. Uh, Keith also has a BS in food science, an MS in analytical chemistry, and food scientist from Rutgers. Uh, a little bit on the previously on. So this is not our first rodeo. Uh, we have covered parts of content around CBD before, and I would encourage you, if you are getting up to speed, to go back and check some of these out. Uh, we did a webinar a few months ago on how to un avoid unconscious incompetence in developing CBD products. Before that, we did one in working with CBD in a regulated marketplace. We also had a webinar on sources of quality in CBD and a very basic ABCs of CBD. Uh, lots of material to cover here. This is a novel and new science. So, who are we? Well, as Fran mentioned, we're a food and supplements company. We specialize in cannabinoids. We are not a cannabis company playing in food or supplements. That distinction is important. Um, it plays out in who we put around the table. So, beyond corporate leadership, we, our commercial leadership and ingredients includes Jolene Jacobs, uh, came to us from Evolve Biosystems, Lupria Nutrition, and Meet Johnson Nutrition, where she had spent her career. Uh, ben Addington is our account manager, and Sean Hong, also, people, Ben himself has an MS in food science as well. On R&D, Keith leads a team that includes food scientists Joycelyn May and Drew Hathaway, uh, both of them coming from Boulder Brands, Conagra, and Gredion. On the manufacturing quality side, Petros Levis leads our manufacturing quality. He came to us from Danone and White Wave, where he ran the pilot plant operations. Before that, he was the general manager of Medallion Labs, General Mills Internal Sensory Lab. Uh, Paige Appleton, our manager of QA, came to us from Church and White. And then on the analytical side, in our own internal group, uh, Victor Zessiger from Eurofins and Dan Watson from AgriScience Labs. So lots of food industry experience being brought to bear on a new category of functional ingredients. So what sets us apart? R&D, food company, CBG company that specializes in cannabinoids, process and manufacturing. We own our own production processes. We developed them from scratch because we had to. Everything we do and everything we have done historically is about ensuring adherence to specification and consistency at scale. Uh, it's about reduction of variance in a novel supply chain. We also do quality assurance. We build robust sourcing standards and span the raw material supply chain. And our QA program is built to ensure quantifiable consistency from extraction to finished product. It's all about what you can quantify, not what necessarily what you can say. Uh, analytical methods. We develop testing methods that have been adopted as standard, standard practice by some of the highest volume cannabis labs in the country. We work with our clients to help develop and validate methods for labs to test their finished goods. These are new complex matrices and analytical 
analytical variance is a real thing, and analytical science is a real science. It requires work. This, you can't just take off-the-shelf solutions and expect to get good results. You have to put in the work on validation. Uh, and then we support everything with customer support. We do the full life cycle from concept to validation. Our team of food scientists, manufacturing specialists, and quality systems experts hail from some of the largest, most respected CPG companies on earth. We know what it takes to operate in a regulated environment. And that has been our goal from day one. And we back it all up with rigorous substantiation. Substantiation matters despite everything. You can see me gesturing to the world at this point. We invest accordingly. So we focus on pharmacokinetics rather than pharmacodynamics. Uh, we think that those are much more in line with the more health-oriented claims. We want to focus on how do we deliver the thing that people want as efficiently as possible. To prove that we're doing that, we work with credible university partners to, on research, and then we publish those results in peer-reviewed open access journals. Uh, and the goal here is to develop desirable, marketable claims with FTC-grade substantiation. We have fielded multiple studies on the CBD side. Uh, we did a PK-1 in February of 2020 that was meant solely as a scoping study, but the results were statistically significant enough that we started making some claims around it, and although, to be honest, others made stronger claims around it than even we were willing to make, given our risk profile. Uh, and then we launched CBD Ingestibles 2, PK-2, in Jan that published just last month, and this is the study we're going to be discussing today. I encourage you to go and download the full study from pharmaceuticals directly. And then I also want to note, it's not the subject of today's, but we have a topical exploratory going on and ch exploring uh, the dermal transmission rates of CBD in various water and oil soluble product formats. You would think that because the body is so, such a large proportion of water that water soluble would necessarily work better. I'm here to tell you that the early observations indicate that's not necessarily true. Um, so you've got to do the work and we are doing the work before we make the claim. So why are we talking about pharmacokinetics? Just to clear a few things up, pharmacokinetics versus pharmacodynamics, how bioactives travel versus what bioactives do once they get there. So in shorthand here is PK is the study of what the body does to bioactives, and PD is the study of what bioactives do to the body. We have focused on the PK route because it underpins PACE claims, things like fast-acting and long-lasting. Uh, they are also relatively straightforward and cost-effective to substantiate in vivo. Blood analysis doesn't lie. It's not like subjective reporting where you need a huge, massive number of men to figure out, to tease out the interpersonal and individual variants and the quirks of self-reporting. We focus on things that are objectively observable. That is what we want to build science around. And then PD underpins the effects claims that FDA and FTC force against, such as relieves pain and reduces anxiety. Those are effective claims. That's why they're forbidden, for the same reason why blue sky laws exist on the security side. So let's back up a second. Let's uh, set the course groundwork here. What went wrong with CBD 1.0? I think we can all agree that something went wrong. And what we would say is that promises were made and promises were broken. This is the results of a survey that was done about asking why do you use CBD and do you find it effective? Half of people who use CBD use it for aches. Only one in four of those actually found it effective for aches. If people aren't finding your product effective for the promises you make, they're going to stop using it. You can claim anything you want and people will buy it once. The question is repeat. You have to deliver on what you say. And the good news is that despite companies failing to meet their promises, Consumers still believe in the category. They still believe in the bioactive. 88% of lapsed CBD consumers still believe CBD is effective. 69% of lapsed consumers would reconsider using CBD. And 92% of potential CBD consumers would try CBD if they knew it worked. So clearly, CBD has a credibility problem. The riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma or not. We know CBD works, so why don't CBD products? Well, Good study, good research shows that CBD triggers effects on a wide array of systems, and we are building our knowledge base of this dramatically over time. We know that people consume CBD products. All you had to do is look at any news source in 2019 or 2018 to see that, but people didn't get the desired effects. So what happened? Well, a lot of things. Here are three product-based explanations for why the category misfired. This is independent of regulatory causes, which are real. So, one, 
products didn't contain the CBD they claimed. This was often true. These are the results from an FDA market analysis of CBD products that contained their labeled CBD content, and that's plus or minus 20%, which we think is actually a pretty wide range to hit, and still less than half of products in every category actually hit that. So that's just straight consumer fraud. Um, two, products didn't contain enough CBD. So this is likely true, but nuanced. The average label serving content of by product format for consumer available products is that we're pretty low. You're talking on the order of 16, 19, 30, 33 milligrams. Probably 20 to 30 milligrams is around the average range. Meanwhile, Epidiolex on the pharmaceutical side, their starting dose in a 75 kilo adult average size was recommended around 375 milligrams per day, up to 1.8 grams per day. So did they contain enough CBD? Probably not. What is enough CBD? It depends on the effect you're going for. More research is needed on that front. And three, products were simply the wrong format. Know this because everybody came out in the last year with all sorts of claims around nano. It's going to solve that problem. And we're going to speak more to this right now. So, again, backing up. What does it mean for a bioactive to work in a consumer's mind? And we like to say you can't feel what you don't absorb. This is the traditional pharmacokinetic curve to explain pharmacokinetic concepts like concentration. The idea here in the area of the curve is that you take something and you consume it and then it distributes throughout your body before it is excreted. And at some point it reaches a certain circulating blood level in your blood and that level is either within the range of action or not. And if it is within the range of action of what people are expecting, they're going to think it's working. If it's not, they're not going to think it's working. So bioactivity does not equal bioavailability. Effect is a function of absorption. It actually has to reach the bloodstream to have an effect. And there's more nuance here. If you deliver too little, consumer gets no benefit. If you deliver too late, you as a manufacturer get no credit. Successful fun functional products deliver expected benefits on time. So if you are too little, consumers come away saying, I don't feel anything. And that might be because you had the wrong dose, just not enough. It might be because you had the wrong product or bioavailability. It also could be from a mismatched expectation. If you market a product as having a foreground effect and it actually has a background effect, you're going to get consumer disappointment. If you market it as a background, as a foreground, you're going to get some surprise. Um, and it could also happen because it's too late. Uh, you might have the wrong product with the delayed absorption curve. And again, mismatched expectation. If you market a product as fast acting that has delayed onset, people aren't going to give you credit for it. We like to say nobody drinks coffee in the morning to perk up in the afternoon. You need to have that effect within, call it an hour, so that you get credit for it. And with that, let's turn to the study. So let's talk about our objectives. At a high level, we wanted to understand the space between what we take and what we absorb. So our motivation, CBD is purported to have a variety of beneficial physiological effects. We've all seen the range of things it has potential for. But empirical research around physiological response is generally lacking. And where research exists, it's often inconsistent, poorly designed, or limited to animal models. So with that in mind, we developed some hypotheses along with Colorado State. One, that discrepancies in response reporting may be explained by differences in product design, and or differences in individual body size and composition. And our goals here were to compare the pharmacokinetics of oral CBD formats over four hours that included benchmarking the characteristics of product consumer form of popular consumer product formats, namely standardized versions of CBD oil and CBD isolate, and assessing the role of product design in enhancing CBD absorption. We also wanted to examine the relationship between body composition and CBD PK, assessing inter-individual variability in CBD absorption across product formats. I'm not going to go into the details too much on that, but it is fascinating how different people absorb different bioactives. And then finally, we wanted to do good science. This is something that we feel has been missing from the space in general, and it is well past time. There were plenty of opportunities where the federal government should have stepped in and done some of this good science, but we are happy to help. Um, so materials and methods, substance before marketing. Protocols here were randomized, double-blind, repeated measures, crossover design, um, 
and procedures were reviewed and approved by the IRB at Colorado State University in accordance with the guidelines of the Declaration of Helsinki. CALIPO approved the design of the study, but we had no role in the collection, analysis, or interpretation of the data, or in the writing of the manuscript, or in the decision to publish the results. We went into this knowing that if we didn't have the best product, it would get published. That was very important for us. It's put up or shut up time in an industry full of talk and not nearly enough science. So we did 15 participants, age 21 to 62, with body mass greater than 50 kg. We excluded some common disorders um, and things that we thought were going to be conflating variables. Uh, venous blood was collected prior to and at 30, 60, 120, 180, and 240 minutes after ingestion. There was a standardized meal given nine minutes following ingestion at the insistence of the IRB. The preparations that we tested, standardized doses of 30 milligrams of CBD administered in eight ounces of water. The controlled preparations were a CBD oil tincture with an MCT base and a CBD isolate powder. The experimental presentation preparations were caliper powder with, uh, with a modified food starch base, a caliper liquid concentrate with a Kalea base, and a caliper liquid concentrate with a gum arabic base. So, key findings. Key finding one, fat-soluble CBD products were never going to work. No CBD in the blood, no effect to experience. Neither tincture nor isolate delivered meaningful CBD content into the blood within the first 60 minutes after ingestion. Circulating CBD from isolate preparation didn't even rise above the level of quantitation until 120 minutes after ingestion or 30 minutes after a meal was given. Meanwhile, water-soluble formats absorbed significantly faster than fat-soluble formats. But relative bioavailability also varied significantly by formulation. So what you've got on the left there is the circulating CBD concentration in nanograms per milliliter over the first 60 minutes. And below is a cumulative area under the curve chart, showing how that AUC builds up over time across each of the preparations. And frankly, when we look at these, the magnitude comparisons, we are being conservative because at 30 minutes, all of these are infinitely better than tinctures and isolates. But we did set a replacement value of 0.01 nanograms per milliliter to be a little conservative on this. Key finding two, product design matters. Buzzwords are BS. Nano alone doesn't imply anything useful about bioavailability. Empirical research is required. So smaller particle size, we have all seen, we have all heard the hype that nano is going to solve your problems. It's going to help with your suspension, your stability. It's going to help with your bioavailability. Theoretically, all makes sense. We were genuinely surprised by these results, but they just speak to this that it is super important. So if you look to the left, this is a sort of stylized version because the emulsion fingerprint is proprietary to us, but a stylized version of the emulsion fingerprint of the three caliper products that were used in this. The one that is not actually nano is the one that performed by far the best. Nano is not the answer. There is more to it than this. So the nano formulations absorb more slowly and were less bioavailable overall than a formulation with larger particle size. Were they better than isolates and oils? Yes. Were they better than non nano no. Not, emulsion fingerprint doesn't necessarily provide a good predictive model either. You can see that our caliper liquid and our caliper powder had very similar particle size distributions when dissolved in water. But, so they had pretty much the same fingerprints, but different absorption profiles, different bioavailability profiles. This was fascinating to us. Um, and neither does water solubility. Three, all three of these formulations are technically water soluble. They all deliver distinct absorption profiles. So what this tells us is that relative pharmacokinetic impact isn't just a function of a buzzword. It's a function of actually doing the work and proving it. So formulation, emulsifier, emulsification process, particle size, and then you have to do the clinical to actually check up on it. Whoops. So. Sorry about that. So learning th four here is that before you make the claim, you have to do the research. With so many factors at play, empirical human research is required. Uh, we have noticed just a couple things that are affecting bioavailability. All the researchers that we worked with are chopping at the bit 
to go after these and learn more about them because they are all fertile opportunities for research. But the bioactive properties itself, the inherent properties of the bioactive are going to contribute. The product properties, the emulsifiers, the particle size, all of that, those are going to contribute. The gut state, better fasted, food interaction, biomel, we believe these all are going to have an impact. And then individual variation, pharmacogenomics, metabolic differences, these are going to play a role. The point of all this is it's more complicated than water-soluble or nano. Cannabinoid science is too novel to support inductive reasoning. We say this all the time with shelf stability, and we're definitely saying it again with bioavailability. You've got to put in the work. So what does it all mean? Well, let's start with why people care, because they care because of regulation. So who regulates non-drug CBD products? And again, this is not legal advice. Even when I was an attorney, I wasn't a regulatory specialist. 92% um, of Americans incorrectly assume or have no idea if CBD is federally regulated. That disgusts me at a visceral level. Um, the FDA is focused on health claims, at least with cannabinoids. The official agency position is because CBD is an approved drug, FDA cannot regulate it as a food or supplement. That is despite the fact that it is widely available and that Congress has pushed its availability. As a result, enforcement is focused on policing drug claims rather than traceability, label accuracy, and GMP or CGP compliance. The enforcement tool of choice for this agency has been warning letters. They have not instituted monetary penalties, and they have not issued mandatory recalls, despite the fact that we believe those are within their authority. Um, I'm going to note that this is a ridiculous and irresponsible state of affairs that can easily be fixed by Congress through H.R. 8179 or more directly by the Secretary of HHS by removing the drug exclusionary rule as it relates to cannabinoids so that the FDA can continue actually regulating for safety and quality the things that people consume. Meanwhile, the FTC focuses on deceptive marketing, and they began touching on that in December, so just two months ago. The FTC is a scary agency. They preserve the truth and advertising standard by targeting companies making spurious health claims unsupported by medical science. And their enforcement tool of choice has been administrative orders with significant monetary penalties. We are talking five and six figure dollar amounts for making unsubstantiated claims. And I will note that FTC oversight for marketing does not obviate the need for FDA oversight for manufacturing and quality. But all this is the thing, it's all fun and games until your insurance premium goes to the roof. You may, the FTC slaps fines. Those fines get paid by you or by your insurer. <laughs> At some point, they're going to get paid, not a warning letter. And what does FTC say about claim substantiation? Well, they say that advertisers must have a reasonable basis for all express and implied claims. And they actually have a really handy-dandy advertising guide for industry as it relates to dietary supplements about bioavailability claims. The anecdotal evidence about the individual experience of consumers is not sufficient to substantiate claims about the effect of the supplement. Individual experiences are not a substitute for science, scientific research. And as an example, in this very extensive and useful guide that I cannot recommend highly enough, an advertiser relies on animal and in vitro studies to support a claim that its supplement is more easily absorbed than other forms. Substantiation is likely to be inadequate because there are significant methodolog methodological problems and because human research is feasible and accepted. Well, human research is standard and feasible, so substantiation requires it. If you're trying to argue that human research is not feasible, I point you to this study. So how can brands move forward? Early movers in the space poisoned the well while regulators sat on the sideline. This became a market for lemons, and now everyone is confused. In 2018, Congress told everyone to go out and make and sell hemp-derived CBD products. 2018, FDA said, don't make health claims while you're doing that. And then FTC came in last year and said, don't make unsubstantiated claims. So what can you do? Well, there are three coherent options that we see. One, you can wait and see. I, this is a completely supportable option. Plenty of brands are staying away until the federal government gets it back together and actually starts policing consumer health. Note, though, that there are no legal restrictions on product development in the interim. Now is the time to test, learn, and validate, to do shelf stability, to actually learn about this novel bioactive that isn't simple, despite what people say. We, this is where I pitch you to come work with us. 
We have plenty of people that we work with who have no intention of launching immediately. They are waiting for the federal government, and we love working with them because it gives us time to make the product right for them and perfect and self-ready so that they can get off the blocks immediately and confidently. Two, you can say damn the torpedoes. It works for Uber. It's worked so far for early movers in CBD. But what was thought of as great marketing is now what I would more accurately think of as uninsurable, saying that your individual CBD Molecule is a tiny one and a half nanometer sized particle processed by your endocannabinoid system almost immediately, so it takes effect in two to three minutes. Prove it. Go do the research. Theories are great. And three, proceed responsibly. Don't make drug claims. Follow food safety best practices. Label ingredients, including bioactive content, completely and accurately. And make promises that matter to consumers and only promise what you can substantiate. That is how to thread the needle in our estimation. And I uh, will wrap it up now with a shameless plug, buy our ingredients, use these data. to we'll be able to make claims based on this. We are Caliber Ingredients. We try and differentiate ourselves on products, professionalism, and substantiation. I, we have put it out there for, to show our work. We've put it out there and published in open access. And please, I hope you look at it. I hope you talk to us. And I hope you ask questions. Science is a moving target. It is getting better all the time. And things are changing, and we are continuing to evolve and adapt and build our knowledge base in this fascinating space. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Fran for questions for me and Keith and bring Keith in as well. But thank you all for your time. All right. Wow, that is some, some dense information, a lot of intelligence there, Justin. Thank you so much for packing so much into such a short, short period of time. We have a lot of questions, and I'm going to just kind of run up from the, the bottom up a little bit, and, um, and then we'll dig into some of the maybe more persnickety questions. Uh, I, on a very top level, um, this is for you, Justin, just to start out. You know, why do you think more companies and brands are not investing yet in clinical research? I, I know that I've been covering this in some of our other content also and just the the importance of this investment, not only for human health, but um, ultimately to be, you know, for commercial for commercial reasons down the line too in terms of validation and appropriate claims. Why do you think that the investment is slow and coming right now? I mean, I think you said part of it, which is just that you need the certainty of commercial payoff to justify investments. These are not inexpensive. They, like, these two take time. I think they are, they are not as expensive as, you know, a 250-member PD trial that actually is covering, like, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase three, but they're not free either. And it's very difficult logistically to put them together. We were very fortunate to work with Colorado State. They have been wonderful partners in a state that is very CBD friendly to figure out what to do here. A lot of people, are, a lot of universities are just staying away because they're terrified of what's going to happen to their federal funding. I think that all goes back to the federal government failing to give clear guidance. Um, you have, in fact, conflicting guidance between Congress and FDA and FTC over what is acceptable and what is not. So it just really has frozen the industry in terms of what they're willing and able to invest in. And then I think the other thing is like a lack of enforcement is, makes it very difficult to justify spending. We have made a bet that is not at all sure that people are going to care about good science rather than just marketing claims. It is very easy to go out there and say CBD cures cancer. The reason why our federal regulatory apparatus polices that claim is because they know it sells. Certainty is the greatest business model known to man. If you don't have clear enforcement on people who make unfounded claims, then it degrades the value of people who are actually investing in substantiating those claims. It makes it less valuable to have a substantiated claim if an unsubstantiated one is just allowed to exist out in the ether without pushback. So I, I think it's been a mix of like they didn't have to, they, it was tough to find partners, and the federal government has disincentivized it. Um, we did this despite, like, we had pushback even internally. It was, why are we spending money on this versus marketing? And honestly, what it came down to is we set out with this company to do good science, 
and that was worth it from the beginning. Credibility is everything. Well, you know, I'm going to ask you a prognostication kind of question. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you, you may not even want to answer, and that's okay if you don't, but I'm going to ask you, you know, you talked about the lack of federal guidance here. Um, we do have a new administration. Um, we do also have um, all bodies in Congress, uh, the House and the Senate, um, in one party. Um, do you think that, again, I'm just, you know, this is prognosticating. This is not necessarily factual. <laughs> do you think that we might see some movement over the next uh, two to four years? Um, and what do you think it, it might look like from a federal guidance point of view? So I think very much so we're going to see movement over the next. We've already seen movement. Honestly, like any movement you see in marijuana is movement in CBD. The cannabis plant is the, cannab is the cannabis plant. Cannabinoids are cannabinoids. Um, and how they are regulated the retail is different from the discussion around what goes up higher on the supply chain. If these move, the, the, the FDA set a precedent with uh, CBD that a developed drug would be preempted, well, the same thing goes for THC. That was a developed drug with Marinol in 1986. So technically the FDA, by their standard, can't touch THC. Well, if you legalize THC, now you've got a, you know, 5, 10, 20, $30 billion market of consumable products completely unregulated by the FDA. That is not a tenable state of affairs for anybody who claims to care about consumer health and safety. The companies in this space need to be regulated, and I'm talking both THC and CBD, need to be regulated for traceability, for GMPs, for food safety, um, and for labeling accuracy. And you can sit there all day and say, well, we don't have the authority to, or we would prefer if this went through the drug pathway, but the problem is that you don't control the means of production. Hemp is in wide production across the country. We're not even trying to control it like we would a single molecule drug substance that's protected by patent. So you have to go up with a regulatory regime that accepts the fact that this is no longer prohibited. In fact, it is encouraged by a myriad of state programs. This is out there. So the only responsible thing to do is either regulate it or recall all of it. Clearly, we are not recalling all of it, and clearly the new administration prioritizes responsibility and public safety. So I think we have a very good chance of seeing them actually embrace the fact that this is out there, and the responsible course of action is to regulate it, not ignore it, and hope that nothing bad happens. I mean, that does seem like the inevitable pathway, and uh, hopefully that will be true sooner rather than later. Um, let's turn back into um, the subject at hand with research here. I mean, to your point and, uh, you know, regulations, this is, we're not talking about, you know, singular molecular um, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, we are talking about uh, cannabinoids that consumers want. Um, so as a food and beverage company um, that's supporting uh, independently, but supporting uh, Human studies. How do you re, how do you use the results from from this particular study to communicate? Are you communicating only with the brands that you're working with? Are you communicating with consumers direct directly? And if you're con communicating with consumers, uh, why do they care? So I think they care because, like I said, you don't drink coffee in the morning to feel it in the afternoon. The consumers want to know that the product they are taking is doing what they hope it's going to do. Um, whatever the effects are that they are seeking, they definitely can't get those effects unless the active is in their bloodstream. So it's a, man, it's a matter of communicating with them, hey, whatever it is that you, are take, that you are using CBD for, whatever your condition that you've discussed with your doctor or decided that you want to pursue uh, some help for on your own, this is the most efficient and effective way to actually get to that level that you're looking for. Um, and we, the goal here with this study is that we can offer this substantiation to anyone who buys these products. They attach to the products. So if you want to develop claims based off of these, you can. The data is there for you if you're buying the products. But we want to make it clear that each individual product has its own performance characteristics. So you can't just go out and make a blanket claim about what is soluble, which is what we used to see people doing, because they obviously understood that consumers wanted effects 
So they wanted the effects faster, and they wanted the effects to be noticeable. We, we agree. That is an easy message, and we have tested and seen fast acting is the winning message. How are you going to prove that? That's a claim that can be substantiated and now has been for our product. So that's, it's, it, it begs an interesting question here. Um, you know, this is, um, your product was used in the study. And um, one of the things that happens uh, frequently, particularly in the supplement marketplace, is the use of borrowed science and uh, substantiation of claims um, that's required by FDA in the supplement world. You've got to have those clinicals behind your ingredients if you've got a proprietary ingredient. So, um, you know, in the study, I think only your ingredient was used, um, and was that deliberate by the um, by those that were designing the study? Um, did they consider using other ingredients also? Um, maybe you can elaborate on that. We considered it, but honestly, since we did fund it, we felt that we were in our right to focus on our own products. If anybody else wants to do their own study, we welcome the, science, the contribution to science. Um, we, and honestly, like, if the results had come back that all of these had the same bioavailability profile, then I wouldn't be able to say that then we would have had a different set of results in terms of outcomes where clinical research matters and you could piggyback. But what our results show is that piggybacking is not actually valid here. That wasn't known in advance. That was just something we discovered. Well, given the results of the study, um, does that imply or does that provide any information that can help imply the best way to ingest cannabinoids? I mean, should they, does it matter whether they're ingested um, with food, with meals, with different types of macronutrients? Is there any implication that can be drawn? Those are all really good questions and areas for further study that we have specifically called out. So when we dig in, and this is not something that was published, but it's something we've looked at in the backside is on the inter-individual variation, it is wild. Um, like everybody absorbs these things differently. There's obviously averages, but the variation is wild. And we are working with the researchers to try and develop hypotheses that are testable um, on why that might be and what might be the factors and figure out how to actually prove those out. So right now it is all theory and it needs, it needs to be proven, but yes, like lots of things matter. Yeah, as, as a, a build, as a rule of thumb, if you're thinking of this water soluble, take it with water, it's going to be more rapidly absor absorbed. If you're taking it with a meal, meals in general are going to have a slowing down effect for absorption and tend to bring down the absorption rate. But more importantly, you're going to see a slower effect with meals. For the water soluble. General thumb for water soluble. Yeah. yeah. Now it's the opposite for fat solubles. Fat soluble, you're still going to get delayed re response regardless, but it should help increase to a certain degree, and we're talking three hours later, we start to see a little bit more availability of it. Yeah, and another area of research that we're really interested in as well is seeing whether the water-soluble absorption pathways avoid, avoid some of the liver buildup that FDA has pointed out as their source of concern with CBD. Because the fat base seems to have much more implications for first metabolism to the liver, where water base seems to have a bit of a, more of a bypass effect, go right straight to the bloodstream. So. And, and is there dosage specificity? Left, 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 left. What's that? Is, is there dosage specificity then? No you specific, know, in terms of the so, concentration, how much you're ingesting? So as far as like to make sure that we're not going into an unsafe range, we, you know, we've studied the research that was done, that's been done going back the last decade on CBD. And what we've seen certainly is that the no adverse effect level, even declared in the epidiolect insert, was one milligram per kilo per day. So you're talking 75 milligrams per day in an adult. The, meanwhile, like the epidiolect uh, dosing recommendations start at 375 or five milligrams per kilo per day and go up to 25 milligrams per kilo per day. And even in patients with severe hepatic impairment, they only recommend pulling it back to 10 milligrams per kilo per day, so 750 milligrams per day. So at the dose levels that we're talking about, we felt like the error, or the, we felt like the margin of safety was extremely generous. Indeed, it is more generous than the margin of safety in caffeine, where one 30 cups of coffee is toxic. Actually, it's closer to 14, but one cup of coffee is totally uncontrolled. 
So we looked at this. One, 30 milligrams is to the best guess of a toxic dose is about a 1 to 35 ratio. Best guess, very, very thumb in the air. But on the caffeine side, you're looking 1 to 14. So we felt that we were very safe in terms of our overall margin for toxicity. And that's a CBD isolate, or is it uh, mixed cannabinoids? It's CBD isolate. Yeah, so we like to work with isolates. We make no bones about it. We think that they are there's very little adulteration space in them. We will mix cannabinoids, but we like consistency. One thing we've noticed is that when you start doing into full spectrum stuff, you end up with inconsistent raw materials that can wreak havoc on your food system down the line, especially with shelf stability. And that's before you even get into the fact that, like, these are unknown bioactives. We, we like to deliver people what they are asking for. Uh, yeah, you know, actually, there were a couple of questions just related to, it's not really related to form, but base, um, you know, for ingestion. People are curious, um, what was the modified food starch? What is the base? Uh, the base is exactly, it's, it's derived from, from corn, and it's uh, enzymatically broken down to be more of uh, just a better emulsifier for food, but food grade. Yeah, so every, all of our ingredients, yeah, that's yes, from okay. corn. All of these are food grade ingredients yeah. purchased from food manufacturers. We don't actually do work with pharmaceutical grade uh, emulsifiers. We focus very much on things that can be fully and transparently labeled according to FDA supplement or food labeling standards. And in this case, it's non GMO corn. Yeah. Oh, great. That's great. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify that because there were a few questions that came in about that. Um, I also just want to tell our audience to, um, you know, we do have more time for questions and there are a lot of questions here and we'll continue the conversation. But if we don't get to your questions, these questions will be supplied to Caliper and uh, it'll be up, up to them to determine this, but they can respond to you directly. And um, also, Justin gave you some contact information at the beginning of the webinar as well, too, um, just to do direct outreach. So you can feel free to do that because you weren't invited by Justin to do so. So if we don't get to your question, it's only because of time and we're, we're not ignoring you. <laughs> and hopefully your question gets answered um, maybe within another one. So moving on. Um, but there was also um, a question just about the size of the sample in this particular study that you've supported. Mm -hmm. um, why 15 participants? Why not more? So, yeah, good question. Uh, we've actually debated at one point, could a study be 100 people? What do you really need to get good statistical resolution? And by study design, by having a crossover design, which is really important that every single person tries every different product, that with the randomized, helps allow for better statistical resolution. So 15 turns out to actually be an acceptable good number to get data that's that's usable. Yeah, that's not just what's exactly and good, it is FDA guidance yeah. for pharmaceutical development for get, putting together a PK study. So we were trying to do this to a high grade. And, it, and ultimately it's the, the statistical variation or the statistical significance is what drives the study design. Yeah, now crossover studies for those who aren't familiar, every, each of the 15 participants did each of the five legs of the study. So that reduced the inter-individual variation. Um, if you weren't doing a crossover design, which is not always feasible, um, especially when you're talking disease states, right. then that is where we would have had to bump up the end significantly to start getting statistical significance. And that's when you're talking the 100, 200 range. The crossover design allowed for a great deal of efficiency. And the other thing you add into it is randomized. So it's, it's truly randomized. Each, each day of testing, Whole different, each product's getting tested each day. So again, by adding different layers in of controls, it allows for the end of 15 to be um, And what Justin was alluding to also, we couldn't believe we, we did a scoping study, the interhuman variability was significant. So again, if you don't have a crossover design, that changes things significantly on how valuable the data will be. How can, um, how can someone best, um, best view the data from this study? What's What's the best way to access that? So the underlying data is proprietary, um, but they, you're welcome to go view the, uh, the published results um, with CSU. And if you are a researcher um, who's interested in the underlying data, please reach out. We're happy to share it for research purposes. All right. Um, a, a little bit, 
a couple of questions again about um, water solubility uh, versus uh, lipid solubility. Um, so, you know, although lipid soluble tinctures are slower than water dispersible products, um, do oil or lipid soluble products catch up in terms of absorption or use? Um, and I guess that goes to metabolism, or do they just not deliver as much of the payload, basically, as a dispersible, water-soluble product? So a lot of that's coming down to the first half metabolism. We believe what we're seeing for the data that ultimately with the fat-based products, they're not just getting to the liver. They're getting screened out before they get to the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. They get lower payload. Inter yeah, interesting. It sounds like sounds like a lot more, um, not just observational, but uh, clinical blood work needs to be viewed to really be able to answer that more effectively. Um, let's see. There is a there's a couple of sort of high tech questions here that I'm not really even I'm not really even sure the best way to ask um, scanning I'm scanning um, so talk about the use of this the terminology nano nano and you know why do you think it's being thrown around so much right now and you know I think you talked about why it shouldn't be why is it because buzzwords sell and it provides a simple solution to a complex problem. Which, you know, markets, everyone always gravitates towards simple but false over complicated but true. Um, so nano is shorthand for better. And we, we would like to say that we can now say better without shorthand. The longhand still works as well. All right. Um, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, brand be wise not so much brand beware you know uh, stick with what's accurate and learn what's accurate um and here's a, a technical question it's probably i don't know which one of you it's for it's probably for for keith and i'm just going to ask it the way it's stated because i don't i um i don't have a good way to reword this but um this is really about the study itself um why is there no a u c um, or VD in the study that we could compare the CAD tincture base rate versus the formulations. Um, and they're, they're positing that without the data, it could be difficult to draw a direct comparison. So, so let's see what you have to say on that. Sorry, Keith's just reading the question. Yeah, so. Yeah. So area deeper curve, and that's from zero to infinity. So if you were to start to take the test past four hours and take it out to for days on end, right, that would give you the infinity value. And the reason why it's not zero to infinity is because money isn't free. Um, each one of those, every time that you test, we had to cut it off at some point um, or else the costs would just spiral out of control. So the area deeper curve at this study was capped at four hours. Yeah. And while we entirely agree that, that is a useful experiment to run, it just – it's not a commercially relevant experiment to run, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. People don't, infinity, at least for the, the use cases that we are dealing with. Exactly, especially the sound report. If, if you're looking for, uh, you know, immediate response for you know, relaxation or sleep or pain management, you don't really don't care about the three-four-hour mark as much as you care about that, you know, 10, 30, 60-minute mark. Uh, if you're talking for a low-level anti-inflammatory response into the body, well then, yeah, you design a study differently that would look at any of the curve over, you know, over a much greater period of time, 12 hours plus. Yeah, and if there's a question behind this question is, I think, why we didn't do an, I, why we didn't do an IV um, to infusion to actually get a baseline on absolute bioavailability, and the simple answer there is that it would have added a ridiculous new layer of complexity to the IRB once you start injecting into people. Um, and we doubt that we could have actually gotten the study approved. So you'd have to pick your battle. Yeah, yeah and um, controlling variables. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You go ahead, Keith. 
was going to say one, one more build. I mean, again, product design. If you're building a product that you want to help fall asleep and then stay asleep for eight hours, well, then, yeah, again, you'd be looking at the underneath the curve that eight-hour mark. Um, yeah, it was all, it's all really what are you product designing your products to do and how do you design your studies to benchmark effectiveness. Well, right, that goes to study design. You know, I mean, are you are, are you trying to validate a presumptive a presumptive effect, or are you uh, observationally are you doing a study to observe what happens and then um, and then remark and build a claim related to what actually has been measured? So that's an interesting um, point that you know brings up a dilemma sometimes in industry, um, particularly again in supplements where you know. A supplement marketer is wanting to build a product around a particular claim, but really it's got to be built around the science. And there's so much more science that needs to happen here. And that, that actually brings me to a question related to um, uh, CBD isolate, which is uh, which is the caliper is using um, versus full spectrum. And um, you know, in the CBD industry, um, there seems to be some tension around how you're producing product and what you're saying and, and consumer perceptions. And, you know, what, what, would, you, what would you say to um, brand holders out there that um, are determining what ingredients and how to process for their products and the claims related to those? Um, I think this could be a two-part answer. Um, my, my first question is, when you just define what your broad spectrum looks like, I think most people have to realize that the minor cannabinoids that are there are present in very small amounts, usually typically 5% or less. If somebody can give a fingerprint that they're designing against, and that's a consistent fingerprint that they can source, then I think that helps solve for why do you want a broad spectrum? What benefit do you want to get based on your and, and fingerprint yeah. every single time the same broad spectrum you're sourcing and then they're creating benefits against those minor cannabinoids. Yeah, that's I think that's right. differently is that when we hear broad spectrum, we hear fruit salad. And every fruit salad is different in every restaurant. And what we think is the same broad spectrum from the same companies will be batch to batch different. That's not on its own a bad thing. I, I want to stress that. It's a bad thing in terms of scale up in terms of stability for branded goods that are looking to add this. But it's not a bad thing if you're really looking for plant medicine from a perspective of, like, I want a tincture and I want to focus on, like, what is the best crop genetics. But if you're talking about a specific effect, you have to de define which cannabinoids at what levels for what effect. And that has to be consistent time and time again for you to actually draw any reasonable conclusion. But if the underlying composition of cannabinoids is changing in every batch, and we all believe and know that every cannabinoid is meaningful and has bioactive effect, then you're just stating a claim that is unsupportable. Um, it's, it becomes a bit of nonsense and a sleight of hand. So if you want to define which cannabinoids and what ratios you're speaking of and towards what effect you're trying to go, then I can believe in the idea of the entourage effect and the synergistic uh, benefits. But without that specificity, there's just way too much swept under the rug there in terms of what you're actually saying when you use that word. Yeah, um, again, it begs the question about further, uh, further controlled study to be able to really uh, draw, draw observational uh, conclusions. Um, I'm looking at the time, I'm looking at the questions here, and we're kind of running down on time. I think that I think that we could have a um, a future roundtable discussion uh, about some of these considerations and concerns. Um, so that's something we'll have to plan in the future. Um, I, I'm going to have to bring us to a close, but all of these questions again will be supplied to Caliper. So Caliper, folks, you um, have the opportunity to be able to respond directly any individual here if you like. Um, I also just want to um, ask you, Justin and Keith, if there's anything else you'd like to add at the end before we bring today's presentation to a conclusion. And the only thing that I will add is if you are listening to this, you are interested in CBD, you are not in the CBD industry, um, whether you work with us or not, please contact 
your uh, lobbying organizations, your trade organizations, and ask them to demand some certainty from Congress, from the administration. It is long past time for these things to actually be regulated and for retailers and brands alike to have a set of quality standards that we can all agree on and share rather than this federated set of nonsense that has come to pass. But the more people who 100. push, the better chance we are. <laughs> we'll have to get it passed. Well, 100%, and, and um, I'm sure that um, the majority of folks that have attended this webinar would, would agree as well. Um, so before we sign off, I'd like to thank you, Keith, for joining in at the end. And thank you, thank you Justin. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. And thank you, Justin, for such a great presentation. Um, so engaging, um, so much information here. Again, lots to follow up with. And um, we thank Caliper Ingredients for supporting this webinar. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to provide it to all of you. And uh, remind everybody again that the webcast on demand version will be available on naturalproductsinsider.com within the next 48 hours, about, and will be available for one year. And we'll be sending a link out to all registrants, whether you were attending today or not. And we thank you all for attending. Have a wonderful remainder of your day. Thank you.